when we're talking about prosody, we are always, um, we must always be aware that there is a great difference in talking about the form uh, of intonation, the form of prosody, and the functions. Uh, sometimes people get those mixed up and talk about both at the same time. So when we're talking about the form, we're really looking at the phonetics, the etic end of it, if you like, where we're concerned um, with the physical manifestation of what we're studying. When we're talking about the function, we're dealing with uh, statements that people make, such as that um, intonation uh, is something which helps us to un understand the grammatical structure of what somebody says, or uh, intonation signals to a listener what our attitude is. Um, people make statements like that. These need to be examined carefully, and I'm going to say a bit about that later. So, it's... Why does my slide go prosodic features and... Oh, <laughs> linguistic structures and interpersonal communication. I thought I'd simply for forgotten to finish the slide. Um, Okay, so uh, we know that there is uh, an intimate relationship between prosody and linguistic structure, um, but we also know that prosody plays an important role in the way in which we interact with each other. Uh, one of these came up yesterday. I was mentioning um, how interesting I find it in discourse intonation to consider the relationship between the two speakers. Uh, the uh, original work that led to discourse intonation often worked on things like interaction between a teacher and children in a class where the role of each person is very clearly defined or the interaction between a doctor and a patient where it's quite clear that the patient is not permitted is not, uh, it is not appropriate for the patient to tell the doctor what's wrong with them or what they need the doctor is the one who will say what's wrong with the patient and if the patient gets that wrong prosodically uh, uh, and it can happen, um, the, the doctor it will typically correct the person that's more or less you know, pull a white coat a bit tighter and sit up at the desk and say, I'm, I'm the person in charge here. Uh, I've taken a little piece out of the Marsec corpus that I've worked with for many years. Um, it's always a little uh, useful little mine for me. I can go mining and just pull out a, an example that helps. This is a, a, si a silly little piece of news from a news broadcast many years ago now um, about an operation to take a whale by road from one zoo in Clacton uh, to another zoo in Windsor. And the passage sounds like this. This is a classic bit of BBC newsreader uh, prosody. Oops. What happened there? The nine hour operation to move Nemo from Clacton to Windsor involved a police escort, medical specialists, civil servants, ten frogmen, and a mobile crane. Okay, so that was uh, about the whale called Nemo um, and his, uh, his extraordinary journey. Let's uh, take a look at that in terms of simple pitch movements first. Uh, the way I transcribe this using the, uh, a very basic transcription system gives us the nucleus on the ray syllable there, the nine-hour operation. Uh, rather surprising to get a four there. Sounds rather final, but um, newsreaders have their own uh, modus operandi uh, to move Nemo. And then we're getting into a list. And if you read most books on English intonation, they will say there's a list is made with a series of rises. So you would expect from Clacton to Windsor involved a police escort, medical specialists, civil servants, ten frogmen, and a mobile grey, a fall to finish it. This newsreader uses a fall rise instead. Uh, let's just listen to that again. The nine-hour operation to move Nemo from Clacton to Windsor involved a police escort, medical specialists, civil servants, ten frogmen, and a mobile crane. Can you hear that civil servant? Uh, Police escort, medical specialists, civil servants, ten frontmen, and a mobile crane. Um, one of the things I was doing a few years ago was just trying to show, really for purposes of exposition to newcomers to prosody, what happens if you take away the variation in prosody. Um, you can do this with a, with a computer, although with varying degrees of success. Here is <clears throat> and, uh, what I managed to get the computer to do 
as near as possible to a monotone. The nine-hour operation to move the boat from Clacton to Windsor involved a police escort, medical specialist, civil servants, ten frogmen, and a mobile crane. <laughs> uh, and another thing that I did was to put in a kind of um, artificial intonation where every stressed syllable has high pitch and every unstressed syllable has low pitch. So it's like a, a, a little machine for generating intonation. And of course, it sounds completely unlike human speech. The nine-hour operation to move Nemo from Clacton to Windsor involved a police escort, medical specialists, civil servants, ten frogmen, and a mobile crane. <laughs> OK. Now to the subject of tempo. Crystal pointed out, and other writers have also, that um, there is a linguistic function to tempo in the sense that you can find a reason why, a or you can normally find an explanation for why a speaker should pronounce some parts of what they're saying very rapidly and other parts very slowly. I said it's grammatical or pragmatic. Let's look at uh, grammatical you will find quite often um, that, the, um, that a subordinate clause, for example, may be spoken more rapidly and at lower pitch. Um, so if I say something like, um, uh, the, the person over there, the one that I was talking to yesterday, is so the, the little bit in the middle, I'm signaling that this is old information, I'm just re recapitulating to make sure that you identify the correct person. So uh, normally that goes hand in hand with a lowering and a narrow, a lowering of pitch and a narrowing of pitch range. But the tempo itself does signal something. And of course we always have to remember in the language teaching context that any time we speed up, we tend to make communication comprehension more difficult. Uh, it's normally quite easy for a native speaker to pick up from a few fragments of syllables what that bit of old information uh, uh, is, but if it's important to you and something just suddenly goes whoosh past you like that, um, you may find problems in picking up the thread again afterwards. Um, in a pragmatic way, uh, we sometimes uh, speak more rapidly for a number of reasons. Uh, some of them are for purely, um, uh, purely for reasons of, of convenience. For example, sports commentators uh, may be speaking very slowly um, until the point when something begins, that exciting begins to happen. The, the, um, uh, the striker gets near the goal, posts is, get, is clearly about to score a goal. Um, not only does the pitch go up and the loudness, but the, the rate of speaking because the commentator has so much more to say. Uh, even more so with tennis, I think. If, you're, if you listen to a, a, a television commentary on the tennis, the speaker can allow the pictures to tell most of the story. Listen to tennis on the radio, um, and this still does get broadcast on the radio, and the commentator has to put everything in. I mean, the ball is moving across at, I don't know, 120 kilometers an hour, um, and the commentator is trying to say what each shot uh, consists of and how successful it is. That's a, 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 a purely um, physical uh, reason for, for doing um, uh, speech at, a, at, a, at high speed. There are other things too. Um, people often say that politicians, uh, when they're saying something that they don't want people to take too much notice of, will say it very quickly um, so that some people will miss it altogether. So they might say things that they want people to believe very slowly and say, I really believe very firmly that prosperity is coming to this country. Unfortunately, we do have a deficit of 25 billion pounds. <laughs> 